Uh, had a pet cat, and uh, the gentleman in this couple absolutely detested the cat. And uh, one day, uh, took the cat for a drive, drove off for like 20 minutes, dumped the cat off, hoping it would be gone forever, <coughs> drove home, and got, by the time he got home, the cat was already sitting on the driveway. So the next day, he tried the same thing. He drove for 40 minutes. Same thing. Cat was back before he was. Tried it again. Kept going farther and farther. Finally, one day, he got so far away, I uh, dropped the cat off. Was sure it was gone forever. His wife got a phone call uh, a little while later from her husband. And the phone call basically said, is the cat back on the driveway? And she said, yes. And he said, can I talk to the cat? I cannot find my way home. <laughs> You ever felt lost? We have a hero in the Bible by the name of Elijah, and boy, did he ever feel lost. In fact, he felt abandoned, he felt lonely, he felt defeated, he felt a little angry, he felt a little sad, and he felt a whole lot of lost. And it's ironic because it is right after Elijah has just won perhaps his greatest victory. He met and with all the priests of the land and the king of the land, and they stood and had a big showdown on a mountain in the north part of Israel. And he called down fire from heaven, and it burned up an altar as he prays. <coughs> The army turns on these priests, and the people turn on the priests of a false god. They wipe them out. Elijah has won. The victory is his. But there's one person. The queen, Jezebel. Now, she's not even controlling things anymore at this point in time. She's majorly angry and vows to kill him. But it's going to be okay. I'm going to tell you why. It's because a man by the name of A.W. Tozer, who was the Lions pastor, once said, God never uses anyone until he tests them deeply. Elijah comes before God and says, I am defeated. In fact, I want to die. I want to die. Now we looked at this passage starting last week, and last week I, I pointed out three things that has to happen for Elijah to be able to come back from this great defeat. And the first one was he needed to be prepared, which was something that God was already doing long before we get to this story. But then he runs away, runs out to the desert, and God basically says, look after yourself. He has to get into the shade, get out of the sun, he has to have some food, and he has to have some sleep. And once he's had that, then God is ready to deal with him. And they talk it out. Elijah talks to God and tells him all his problems. And I said, that's something we need to do. We need to be able to come to God in prayer. And if we can't do that, to go and to talk to other people who can come before God on our behalf. And sometimes we just are not ready to necessarily express everything to God, but I'm talk to myself or to somebody else who's trusted and pour our hearts out. <laughs> Remarkable thing, God prepares him in advance and he says, look after yourself, have some tea, have a nap, and then they talk it out. But God's not quite done there. And we're going to add three more points today that we're going to add to this as we're going through tough times. Because it's all about learning to hear God properly and figure out what is God's plan when it seems like everything in our life is falling apart and we're too stressed or we're too sad or we're too lonely or we're feeling too abandoned to really think that we can hear God. Francis Chan's an author, and I was looking him up this week because I want to 
quote him extensively in actually next week's sermon, but as I was looking up this quote that I want to use next Sunday, I came up with a little statement that he made that I think is bang on right. And he said this, If life were stable, I would never need God. If life were stable, I would never need God. Elijah goes to Mount Horeb. We have no idea where this Mount Horeb is, except for this, as scholars who studied it and looked at this Mount Horeb and looked at the story and examined it fully, scholars are quite convinced, and so I'm going to acknowledge with them and go with them, that it is the same as what we find in the book of Exodus that is called Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai was a very important location in the Bible, and I think the location is going to be key to understanding this story. Mount Sinai first comes to our attention when, a lot, when Moses is on it, and he sees a bush, and it's on fire, and the bush doesn't burn up. And God speaks out of the bush. Later, Moses brings the entire people of Israel to this mountain, and they meet with God, and God speaks to them in a powerful way. And in particular gives them the Ten Commandments and the rules by which they can understand the covenant of I will be your God, you will be my people. And what does that mean? It's a remarkable place. And Elijah goes to this holy and historical place. And is God going to speak to Elijah in the same way he spoke to Moses? Is God high pain? Is Jeff here? There he comes. Hi, Peyton. Dad's over here. No, we are not drumming right now. <laughs> We're going to talk about the noisy ones in a minute. Let's go see Dad. Hey, baby. See you later. Is God going to speak to Elijah in the same way that he spoke to Moses? Because that's what Elijah's expecting. You read through Elijah's history, and Elijah is a God. Elijah's the guy, when God speaks through him, it's through the big, it's through the bold, it's through the brash, it's through fire falling out of heaven. <clears throat> It's through prayers that get the attention of kings because they are unavoidable. Droughts, floods coming later because of rains. I mean, he does dramatic things. And Elijah's God is a dramatic God. Does God always speak, though, in the same way? You go through how God speaks in Mount Sinai. I mean, I mentioned this burning bush. It was pretty dramatic. Fire. God speaks through fire. You go through a little bit later on Exodus 14. And um, they're getting ready to go to Mount Sinai, but they got this issue. There's an Egyptian army behind them, and there's a sea in front of them. And God whips in as a wind that drives back the sea. You probably know this story. They're able to cross through and head to Mount Sinai dry ground. Later in Exodus 19, just as they're getting ready to get the Ten Commandments, we read, we read this. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of, the, of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. God speaks there in storm, 
fire, and an earthquake. Later in Exodus 24, we read this, where Moses meets with God, and in verse 17 it says, To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. God appears strong, powerful, mighty, and he speaks to Moses. Moses and Elijah are often paired together in the Bible. Certainly in the New Testament, we find Jesus is on what's called the Mount of Transfiguration, and a vision of, of Moses and Elijah appear to him. Later in Revelation, we discover a story of, of something to come where Moses and Elijah are together. And Moses comes to the same mountain where Elijah was later to go. And God appears to him in the wind and in the earthquake and in the fire. And in those things instilled the fear and the wonder of God into both himself, Moses, and the people as a whole. Now Elijah comes. And his emotions, his circumstance, are speaking to his heart. The devil and other enemies, such as Jezebel, are destroying his confidence. He is stressed, he is broken, and just like us, Elijah is trying to hear God speak. <coughs> We need to wait expectedly for God. Elijah arrives at this holy mountain. Elijah, why are you here? It's all he gets from God. Why are you here? And his reply, I worked hard. I was loyal to you, and you are not holding up your end of the bargain. My life is in tatters. And God replies, go up onto the mountain and wait for me. Does God just speak to powerful, holy people? I mean, he certainly doesn't speak out loud to many of us, but does God still speak to us? We're maybe not quite at Moses or Elijah's level. Sometimes, when everything is going right, we certainly cannot hear the voice of God. I was reading the story of Charles Spurgeon, the famous powerful preacher of about a century and a half ago, who confronted evil in his society and spoke out in such a way that the world heard. But he was a man who was also prone to great seasons of discouragement. And he said that in between all of his seasons of success, there were times in which he felt God had abandoned him, and he felt that he just could not hear the voice of God, and then he was finished. And then he also wrote that those were the moments in which his character was developed the most, and prepared him for a season of success. Sometimes I may not be in the right frame of mind, and sometimes God does not act in the time that I would like. I'd like things quicker, but that feeling that I might have in those minutes does not mean God has abandoned me. I wonder why Elijah was sent here. I mean, Elijah's feeling discouraged at this beginning. The queen is after him. Why did God just stop him and say, hey, whoa, whoa, Elijah, hang on. I know you're feeling discouraged this morning, but uh, stiff upper lip, put your chin up, get back to work. Instead, he lets Elijah cross two old countries, walk for 40 days into the desert. He goes for months, months, between when God could have stopped him here and when he gets to the mountain. Why doesn't God appear to him right away? And I think it's because Elijah was not ready for the message that God had for him. God was not ready for the message 
or Elijah was not ready for the message God had for him. We all go through seasons of waiting for God. And Elijah's going to be made to wait some more because he goes up on the mountain. And the God he expects is a God of power and action and might. That is how he's related to God. And this is the place where God has appeared in power and action and might. And just like happened with Moses, a wind comes up that shatters rocks. A wind so powerful, we would not be able to believe it. And he looks out at that wind. It is a wind even more powerful than Moses experienced. And he senses, I don't know how, but he senses God is not within that power. An earthquake so violent, the mountain shakes and the roots of the mountain move. A violent earthquake. And a God had spoke in the same place through an earthquake. God had spoken through this power previously. Is he going to speak now? And Elijah listens. And he hears nothing. A fire races up the mountain face. Elijah apparently is hiding in a cave. The cave appears safe. But God has spoken through fire more than anything else at this mountain, from a burning bush to fires consuming it when the Ten Commandments come down. Surely God will speak through the fire, but the fire rises up and there is still no message from God. Has, I mean, surely at this moment, God has abandoned Elijah. Because everything that Elijah has waited for comes empty. God usually spoke in this way. And he's looking for God to speak as he has spoken in the past. And do you know what? God does not always act in our time. He does not always act in the way that we expect or in the way that we want. In fact, usually he does not. And to continue to do the work of God and continue to grow, he needed a new, fresh vision of God. I ask, when we don't see God right away or in the way we want, do we still expect him? I've talked to many, many people over the years. Once felt close to God and said, I don't feel so close to God anymore. It's because they're looking for the same old thing and God wants to do something new. But they don't necessarily want something new because new can be uncomfortable. So Elijah keeps waiting. And the noise is replaced by a gentle breeze. And the prophet who calls down the mighty is confronted by a gentle image of God. We need to learn to listen to God. Once again, God looks at Elijah and says, why are you here? Elijah repeats the same answer about how everything's gone wrong. How everything's a failure. Everyone's failing me. The victory he had won, however, against the prophets of Baal was a great gift. He now needs to know the gift giver. Author Chuck Swindoll wrote a book about Elijah. He wrote a book about Elijah, probably reading it these days. He tells the story of a gentleman he knew who was in hospital with cancer. <clears throat> And he was put in isolation, couldn't see his family. Uh, but he had brought along a, a gift for his son when he went to the hospital, a little card that he had carved. And his son came to the hospital, his mom brought him, and he had an orderly bring this card to his son. And he 
And he stood, there was a big atrium with some windows out. I kind of picture this as he described the story of me ever being in that. The University of Alberta Hospital, I kind of think it's like that, with big windows and you can look down. He was looking down into the, to the atrium, into the lobby, and he could see his son, and the orderly brought down the car to him, and the, the kid took the car, and he was all excited, and he ran and gave the orderly a huge hug. Swindoll said the man was devastated looking at them. <coughs> I want to get credit for this. Oh, my son to acknowledge me. And the kid's jumping up and down, and he's looking at the, the orderly, and his mom's there, and giving the orderly the big hug. And he's up in his window trying to wave. No, I'm up here. I'm up here. He said eventually they did point out, oh, there's your dad up there. And he, he waved and all that. But you know what? I almost think that's like us. Sometimes when we have good things happening and we have blessings and we have things from God, we sometimes become so transfixed on the gift and the blessing, we forget about the one who's given it to us. And sometimes we almost need to lose it to look up and to look at the one who has given us the gift. Elijah knew the victory he had once. He knew those around him were failing him, and, but he needed to remember the God who had given him the victory. And Elijah hears the gentle whistle of a slight breeze. And at that moment, he's ready to hear God. John 10, which I read earlier. Those who hear my voice will know me. Those who hear my voice will know me. Elijah hears the quiet whistle and he knows it is his God. Never mistake God's quiet voice for his absence. We should expect to hear the voice of God, but not limit God to hearing him in the way that we want to hear him or in the way he has in the past. I just uh, actually this week finished reading a, a really good book on different ways in which people worship. And some of us, when we worship and we get to know God, it's through a deep study of the Word of God. And then this book gave some tests and things like that that you took and tried to determine how you got it. And for me, it was studying the Word of God. That, and studying things about God, and that's really how I relate to God. Other people, it, it's, it's more through celebration. Others, it's through quiet meditation. Others, it's through a walk through the woods and looking in nature. We all relate to God in some unique ways, but this book was really good because in the end it said, just because this is what you're best at now, don't limit yourself to trying other things. And try to hear the voice of God in other ways. I thought it was bang on right. Don't stop listening. Ask God to speak into your life in a new way. He wanted a God, Elijah, who spoke through earthquakes and storms and, and fires that came down. But that's not the God he needed to hear at that moment. And Elijah, just like us, had to discern how to best listen to God in ways that did not limit who God was. And God's response to him is very interesting because it's our sixth thing here, it's get to work. He tells him, I want you to go to a foreign country and appoint a king. Then I want you to go to Israel and appoint another king. And then I want you to go find an apprentice. His name is Elisha. Elijah, Elisha. Very confusing when you get two guys with very similar names. These are going to be the people who are going to bring justice. And by the way, you're not alone. There are 7,000 people in Israel who still love me. You may feel deserted, but you really do have friends that care about you. And I should start with those 7,000. Because Elijah had feelings that betrayed him. Emotions can seem very real, but do not necessarily reflect reality as it's perceived by other people and as God sees it. Our emotions can trick us. 
And I don't know how many times I've had people in my office who form judgments against that church or against me or against something saying, well, you people believe this about me or people are saying, no, that's not true. But they're convinced in their own emotions about something and their emotions aren't reality. And they give an unfair reading. My intentions, my attitudes, or somebody else's intentions and attitudes. Do you know what? I've probably done that with other people. I've formed judgments that are unfair. We need to be careful with our feelings and emotions and assuming they're right. We need to look for encouragement. And sometimes that's through finding that there are 7,000 people who still listen to God. We sometimes need to find encouragement in unusual places. I mean, hey, you can even pull out. I really think you can even find encouragement in the Viking Weekly Review. You may see a letter recently. Dear Editor, I had the pleasure of attending the Penny Carnival with my son and two nephews. It was my first time there. The boys had a blast. They were so excited about the hot dogs and treats, the face painting, the bouncy things. All the games and finally the prizes. We were there over two hours and they could have stayed longer. I'm glad they did, but I was tired. Um, the organizing committee, all the volunteers did an awesome job. Thank you for the event. Putting smiles on all our faces, making me remember memories of my first penny carnival at the local library. Thank you for all your hard work. I mean, how about that? Sometimes we just need to look for encouragement where we can find it. I don't say anything about it everything we did, but you know what? That, that... Sometimes we just need to find encouragement and get to work. Because encouraging moments are reminding us that God is at work in others' lives, helps us to keep doing things for Him. Elijah's saying, or is, is being told, you go and talk about me. Go to this kid. Go to this gentleman. Go to this guy. And, and, and more than anything, go to Elisha, who's somebody we're going to have a whole sermon about later. Go to him. You tell them about me. You do the work. Because as you tell the good stories, you start to feel better about who I am. God can do great things. We need to do this in this specific order. Step one is not in this chapter. But God is at work in our lives always, helping us be prepared. And in those moments of discouragement then, we should look after ourselves more than at any other time. We should be people who talk it out with God, who pray to Him, who wait expectantly, knowing that He has not abandoned us, but wait for it because He's going to get to speaking to us just in the right time. And when He does speak, whatever the way, whether it be through the counsel of friends, whether it be through scripture, whether it just be through a still voice in our lives, listen to him. Even if it comes in a way we did not expect, and then get to work.